What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Stay Hot. I'm Bladen Kirk, joined as always by my two favorite co-hosts of all time in Matthew Spahnauer and Theo Ash. Today, we are joined by a very special guest, PFF analyst slash NFL contracts and cap space expert, Brad Spielberger. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. We did this Today, to answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Theo. All right, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Bladen. I need to shut up. Theo, this dude, Theo, is a notorious interrupter, I guess. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so today we're obviously going to discuss some recent contracts um, and some of the recent contract negotiations that are going on, like Kyler Murray. Um, and then we're going to probably talk about some NBA after we kick Brad off here. And then uh, we have we have another rank it for you guys today. So we'll discuss that as well and i don't think i won't spoil it yet but we i might i might actually yeah we're doing we're doing villains we're doing like tv show and movie villains so i don't know if you have any favorite villains brad but i'll, th- I'll think of one i'll throw it in at, at some convenient time all right all right <laughs> but make sure you guys join the chalkboard because that's where we get the rank it segment so if you want to be involved in that make sure you join the chalkboard link is in our bio links in the description below and make sure you subscribe to the youtube for more great content but let's hop right in theo i will let you i will let you run now <laughs> is cap space real brad that's all i want to know <laughs> that's all anybody wants to know i fight my battles saying that it is why or i assume it is real otherwise you probably wouldn't have the title you do why why is it real <laughs> Right. That's the thing is that if I want to keep my job, I have to give this answer so that I have, you know, importance. Uh, I appreciate you fighting the battle. I I would say this, and I know it sounds funny, but the cap is real. There are restrictions from the salary cap. Player contracts are not real. And obviously player contracts are what make up the salary cap. So it sounds kind of funky, but um, you can manipulate it to an extreme degree. The cap is not a one year thing. It's a five year thing at all times because of how you can push money down the line. Um, But it it is real, um, you know, for sure. Okay. So the cap is real contracts or not. So what what would you say like the Christian Kirk contract, for example, right, comes off as like one of the worst contracts. Everyone was like, oh, my God, how dare you give Christian Kirk so much money? And it kind of exploded the wide receiver market. But do you think it's as bad as, you know, a lot of people make it out to be? It really is. I can tell you this after that deal came through. So first, before the deal came through, I had a couple conversations with folks that repped other wide receivers and were kind of trying to get get a gauge of the market and see where things were going to go in free agency. My initial projection on our site was 14 million per year, I think, for him. And I had a couple agents that were like, hey, man, you're way too high on Christian Kirk. He's going to get like 11 or 12 million a year. And I was like, hey, look, you know, I did, I did ran the numbers, watched some tape. Like, I'm going to stick with that. I think he's a solid player, whatever. It comes in at 18. I can tell you for a fact, multiple teams and agents had to hit the pause button on active negotiations and be like, (laughs) we need to reevaluate and kind of reassess the entire market because this deal is so far out of line with what we think he's worth. I mean, the guy has never had a 1,000-yard season. Um, Obviously, it's a volume step, but nevertheless – um, the issue there is, yeah, I mean, it just you try to pay a player for what they've done and also project going forward what they can be. Um, and that deal was just 18 million per year for Christian Kirk is just not what anyone expected. I saw a theory and I wonder, like, I can't remember who is who is pushing it, but the Jaguars who are in no contending like realm right now, like I wonder if they would just offer too much money to throw a monkey wrench in everything because because of that deal maybe directly because of that aj brown is out of their division now right like i wonder if that do you think like it was just a bad contract or do you think like teams who have the money to spend don't care if they overspend because it could you know have this domino effect or do you think they there's no way they were thinking that far in ahead Unfortunately, that Galaxy brand idea would be great for them. Um, What I've heard is basically there's a Jaguars tax and that if you're trying to convince (laughs) a player to come play for you, you have to pay more than, you know, if the New England Patriots offered Christian Kirk X, the Jaguars have to offer X plus 10 percent. So I I wish it was diabolical like that. Like you said, you get A.J. Brown out of the AFC South. Um, But no, I unfortunately do not think that was in their calculus. (laughs) <laughs> that makes a lot more sense than the Jaguars did something really, really smart, actually. That makes a lot more sense. Doesn't it bother the players that, like, a lot of these deals, they get like, oh, you always see the report of, you know, like four years, 80 million, whatever. And that's not really the amount of money that they're going to end up getting. And that 
these deals, these teams can, you know, not promise all these money, obviously, because it's not all guaranteed, but give off these big contracts that they know they're not going to make it to the end of. I don't understand it at all. I, I, I've had conversations where I say, why as an agent would your player want? I mean, look, it's so the agents can look good and can get this report that they've agreed to this massive deal and help their player get this huge contract. But yes, you have fans who are always siding with, bill, not always, but a lot of them siding with billionaire owners and asking their players to take team-friendly deals and hometown discounts and all this nonsense when these players should be chasing as much money as they can make in a short career in the NFL. I, yeah, I really do not understand it. Not not only they put out the, the value they're never going to earn, but they'll they'll add incentives and all these wacky things that are not really part of the base value of the deal. Um, yeah, it's a great question because I don't really get it either. Do you have any opinions on like who some of the best agents in football are? Like guys who you look at who you look at and be like, that's a dangerous guy to deal with if you're a team because he's always going to, you know, represent their guy fa- fairly. This isn't dodging the question, but I, I do think there's like different ways to go about it. So like there is the the component of this guy is a tough negotiator. He's going to drive a hard bargain. But I also think at the same time, there's guys that that are honest with their guys, take care of their guys, but have managed expectations and are are clear with them on, hey, look, like this is what your market is and, and, and where it's going to be. And because of the fact that they're honest with both sides, they're able to consistently get deals done and have good relationships across the NFL. So I'm, I'm not going to drop any names. I, I'm sorry, but there are. <laughs> no there problem. are definitely there are definitely good agents and, and I think less good agents. Um, but I would say more so for me, it's looking at how do you treat your players as people, as individuals off the field and on the field? Um, and, and there are definitely some, some good actors and bad actors in those spaces. I was about to say, I don't even, are you, I was about to ask if you were even allowed to disclose that kind of information. <laughs> I'll just, I would just say this, like we, we do work with some of them. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I, I probably, I mean, I don't know. I haven't signed anything, but I just, I just don't want to, but, but no, there, there are people that go about the business the right way. Um, and, and they deserve credit for that. Uh, and they get it, you know, in other places, I suppose. <laughs> So a lot of people have been also talking about like the Rams and and how you know how have they been able to sign all these guys back and th- the point we keep going back to is well look at all the guys they lost and they lost Von Miller I mean they haven't lost Odell but there's no guarantee he returns you know do do you do you like what the Rams have done this off season or do you think like it's been more of a net negative yeah, it's interesting. I, I would say with them, you know, they're spending almost $300 million in cash for the year now. So like when people say the cap's not real and all those conversations, you can push money down the line and and spread out your cap hits over a number of years. But they're spending well above what the actual cap hit is, you know, in the single year. But like you said, you are losing players. You're not going to be able to keep everyone year in and year out. Um, the Von Miller loss was a big loss, no question, to the Buffalo Bills. I don't know, though. I still do think probably, I mean, bringing in Allen Robinson on a decent deal, about $15.5 million per year, which I think, you know, is in part due to him. I'm not going to say he was checked out last year on the franchise tag, but, you know, the Bears were awful. He, he did not want to be there or he wanted to be given a multi-year deal that he earned and deserved. Um, I think that deal is going to look phenomenal, um, even, you know, whether or not Odell comes back. But I hear you. Yeah, I, I think the whole narrative on them is kind of silly. Um, when everyone says they get rid of all their picks and they hate draft picks, they've actually made top 10 most draft picks in the NFL over the last five years. They're just not in the first round. Um, so, yeah, the, Ram, the Rams are fascinating. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing something different, and, and obviously it's working for now. You mentioned cash and how they're spending, you know, maybe more than the cap hit. And, and using that, how does that work? The difference between cash, because I know like Aaron Donald's cap hit this year and same with Stafford. I think it's only like three and a half million, I want to say. It's something real low or their base salary or something like that. Uh, could you maybe go into specifics on how like cash is maybe different than than cap hit? Yeah. So depending on what you're paying to the player, it's treated differently on the salary cap. And this is what the Rams, the Saints and the Eagles and some other clubs and how they're able to get away with this is that if you pay a salary, which for Aaron Donald's one and a half million dollars, like you said, that all hits the current year. So his one point five million salary all hits the 2022 salary cap. When you pay a signing bonus, you can spread it out equally up to five years. So give him a $20 million signing bonus, it would just be $4 million in that first year. And so when you hear about restructures and you know in the media and they talk about you know restructures and all that, it's the same principle where you're converting single-year money into five-year cap hits and spreading it out. Um, so that's what they've been able to do. You can get away with it for a while. They did it with you know Todd Gurley and Brandon Cooks and took on these massive dead cap hits, which 
Dead cap is just when you have cap allocations for guys not on your roster. Um, Jared Goff set a record when he got traded for the most dead cap, although Carson Wentz surpassed it like a week later. But nevertheless, you can get away with it. But at a certain point, it does catch up to you. It's kind of like a credit card. Um, the same, people say, say the Saints got away with it forever. They went 7-9 three years in a row with Drew Brees as their quarterback in his prime. So I wouldn't argue they didn't get away with it forever. Eventually, it catches up to you. So when do you think it will catch up to the Rams? Like how much longer do they have before it all implodes and they just can't keep their guys? I think probably 2024, 2025. I mean, the one thing too is the draft. If you hit in the draft, then you can kind of get away with it. But as we all know, like the draft's random. You're not always going to be able to outperform everybody else in the draft, especially for the Rams and your first pick is in the 100s. Um, that is the great equalizer, though. If you get lucky and continue to kind of just hit on those picks, you can do it for longer. But if they have like two – bad draft classes in a row it could they could be screwed very soon yeah think about where the saints would be if they didn't have that draft class that was like rams chick and Lattimore and trey hendrickson and i can't remember who else marcus it was like williams marcus yeah. williams yeah it was like high level starters <laughs> like from yeah. top to bottom and it's like if they didn't hit on that it could be like to get all that cheap cheap talent for like four years on a rookie deal is part of the reason why they've been able to do this and obviously you can't bank on that kind of drafting all the time so i feel like well, and, yeah and, and they've had a good coach like that, and, that yeah a lot, they're good they're good i mean i, I when, when it comes to the saints i have a pretty saints fans hated me for a long time because i predicted them to go winless last year <laughs> i i i noticed that you know, i was like wow they are they're a hundred million dollars over the cap there's no way they get out of this and then they got out of it um do, do you think it gets to like if you if you were an owner, like if, looking at this from like a team perspective, do you see kicking the can down the road like this? Do you see that as like something you would do or do you think it's kind of shooting yourself in the foot long term? So this is the interesting thing, too, is that it really just comes back to how rich the owner is. I mean, obviously, they're all very rich, but different degrees of very rich. Um, you know, talking about the Rams and Stan Kroenke, he's independently wealthy. He's also married to a Walmart heiress. Like, the Saints and Gail Benson, she literally – every team has a budget. The Saints don't have a budget. They spend whatever they want to spend, and then she just says, go win as many games as possible. So, yeah, I mean, if I was a win-maximizing owner, I would – of course, personally, yeah. If I was a billionaire, let's talk about it. Um, <laughs> no, like, yeah, for sure. But for some of these, like, family-run teams, like, they can't do that. Like, the Bengals and, and some of these teams, the Steelers and Packers and Bears, like – they would love to do that. They can't. Their, their main source of income is the team itself. They're not independently wealthy, um, and they really can't compete on that scale and on, on that level um, that other teams can. Is that because if you go over the cap, you pay, is it like luxury tax in basketball? Like, because the NFL has a set salary cap, right? Like, you can't go over 280 million, right? Or, yeah, that's the number, right? Uh, 208. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. 200, yeah, 208 million, no matter how rich your owner is. So, how does, why does having like a richer owner affect how much money the team gets? Yeah, so it's not that there's a tax or anything like that. It's really just, you know, how much they're willing or their ability to spend. I mean, again, like the teams do make a ton of money. And I think all the teams, even the, the poorer owners, it sounds dumb to even say, but, you know, like they, they put all the money they make right back into the team. But, the, the wealthier ones are able to just spend more. Like I like like yeah, I just don't think the Bengals can spend three hundred million dollars in one season in cash on, on a team. Like it's just not feasible for them. Um, they probably would not be as profitable as that as they like to be to to be sustaining. You know, we've seen issues like the Raiders and Chargers. Like they have kind of like these financial questions of what's going on, and the Broncos family they just sold, but they're fighting over ownership. Like yeah, they make a ton of money, but from a liquidity and cash flow perspective. Um, it's a whole different game. All right, all right. That's a whole different conversation. Now yeah. we're getting real deep. <laughs> now we're getting real deep. That's interesting though. I think that's, I think that's an interesting part of it is like talking about the owners and stuff like that. And yeah, yeah I guess I, I never thought about it. It's that to even a higher degree in the NBA too with, yeah. you know, the luxury tax and whatnot. And then MLB, it's completely ridiculous. <laughs> so how rich your owner is, is probably the most important thing to the team. Right. Yeah, I just I, I I guess I never really processed that it affected the NFL at all because I'm like, oh, they have a hard salary well, cap. Yeah, because there's a hard salary cap, but then there's also a pretty because, high floor for the salary cap. So it's not like a team could just go out there and spend ten million bucks and field a bunch of us. you know Yeah, just, just <laughs> a bunch of seventh round picks or whatever. <laughs> No, hey, no I think the, that's the, the great Browns equalizer. Sign me for yeah. a thousand yeah, right. dollar a day contract, I'll <laughs> get played in some reps. 
Yes, he would love it. He sa- he has gone on record saying that he is better than the worst NFL wide receiver, which is just not true. Like, like, but a, like a practice squad guy? Absolutely. You're not. No, you're not. Sure. <laughs> no, you're not. What, no, you're what's not. your resume? Like, are you at least like a college football player? <laughs> like, no. no. <laughs> I just overconfident. I love twice. it. I love it. <laughs> I ran a four four nine at the draft. Okay. Like, I, <laughs> That's, I, I can run. <laughs> laser and, or hand time? It was, We're not it sure. Was the, it was at the draft. So I don't We're know what sure. their timing system is. I ran a four point. I ran a four point like eight, and I know that that's probably about point three seconds off from what I actually run. But anyway, I digress. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the the quarterback contracts that are coming down. Like obviously, uh, who reset the market this this year? It was um, did, no Josh Allen was last year. Did anybody? I don't know. Rodgers. Rodgers. Roger. Oh, yeah. Rod, my quarterback did <laughs> your, that. Your guy. Yeah. My guy. Do you think um, that'll just keep happening? Do you think that there's a point in the foreseeable future, like kind of wide receivers now, uh, where teams are, instead of paying that premium, like $30 million seems to be about the point where some of these teams are like, we'd rather trade this guy away. When you look at Lamar, when you look at Kyler, when you look at about $50, $60 million cap hit for maybe some of these quarterbacks in the future, do you think we're reaching a, a point of uh, it's not worth it for these these elite quarterbacks? I really don't with the elite ones. I think the adjustment we'll see is like the second tier of guys, like your Kirk Cousins is your Derek Carrs, like it, on their first deals. Like those guys, I think will struggle more to get a deal. You know, I think honestly, like a Baker Mayfield is a good example right now. Where like five years ago, the Browns probably just extend Baker Mayfield going into last season. Um, you know, because he was good enough and won a playoff game and and all that stuff. And now I think. That's the market we're going to see go away, and teams are going to say either we have an Aaron Rodgers for an ungodly amount of money, or let's just do a one-year flyer on like a you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick type quarterback until we draft the next guy. Um, I think it's that middle tier that gets hurt, but yeah, the, the, the elite guys, it's, it's going to go up and up forever. What about the stat? Like, I think it's thirteen percent of the salary cap that, like, a quarterback who makes over thirteen percent of the salary cap has not won a Super Bowl since like. Steve Young. I, I assume you've probably heard that. And that's that's one that I always think about. Um, do you think that that's kind of a, a, a fake stat or a misleading stat or, or is that one legit? No, yeah, I think it's a fake stat. Like you said, you probably heard it. I've heard it like a hundred times. Um, yeah, I, I think it's kind of a convenient and, and a fake stat. For one thing, like we talked about the restructures, like there are guys that were making a ton per year, but then maybe the team decided to go ahead and restructure their deal. So their cap hit in that singular season may have been you know, less than 13% of the salary cap. Um, I will say, though, this. I do think that the league is looking into ways to kind of change how quarterback payment um, is treated. Because the, the best value you can have in the entire NFL is a good quarterback on a rookie contract. And I do think some teams, probably the Packers, think it's maybe gone too far. Um, but at the same time, if you're like if you're the Bengals, for example, not to keep picking on them, but we talk about parity in this league and everyone like kind of touts the you know the NFL for having good parity. The Bengals and the Chargers with Justin Herbert, like that's how those teams can compete and contend because they land an elite quarterback who's making nothing compared to their talent, and then they can spend around that guy. I think that's the great equalizer in, in the sport. For sure, for sure. Uh, what else have we got? Do, do we do we dare talk about the Cleveland Browns? <laughs> <laughs> do we? Well, I mean, a big Browns fan. Deshaun yeah, Watson. yeah, and the whole Watson contract here is now a whole debacle i mean with a lot of these contracts so you get to this point where they're all super bloated and they're all just these ridiculous amounts of money and at this point it's no fun to even talk about them because you're like that's not real that's not really going to get paid (laughs) do you think you get to a point where players start to like realize that a little bit more and those like fully guaranteed contracts become a little bit more popular because right now we've only seen a couple of them so we have seen a push for it so i'll say watson's is kind of I, i think an anomaly and some people have asked me like do you think that's gonna you know, quarterbacks are going to point to that now. I think people need to realize Deshaun Watson was basically a free agent. I mean, the guy was a top five, top 10 quarterback in his prime years and basically went through free agency, which is not a thing that happens. Those guys will get franchise tagged or, or, or the league will, and the teams will leverage against them in a way um, that just didn't happen there. But I do. You see it. 
I think is very important with the Pittsburgh Steelers. TJ Watt was the first player to ever get guarantees outside of the first year of his deal for you know a non-quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger did. but And now Minka Fitzpatrick this past week um, also was able to secure guarantees in the later years of his deal. So they are pushing back against that, trying to get actual assurances in the later years of that contract, and that's, that's obviously a good thing to see for the players. What was I going to say? Is there language in Deshaun's contract where it could be voided in case of a 60-game suspension or, or something like – Obviously, we have no idea what's going to happen with that. But like for Browns fans, like wondering if it's on the table, like if there was a massive three year suspension or something like that, would would those guarantees still go to him or uh, what's the deal with that contract? And in, in that so situation? my understanding is there is specific language that if the suspension relates to this entire instance, and I will say, obviously, you know, I had this conversation when there were 22 lawsuits. Now, I guess there are 26, but nevertheless, right. like if it is anything to do with what is currently happening, my understanding is no, that the money is protected. The money is safe. I mean, the, the Browns, obviously, you'd think would have to kind of take that and understand that's part of the equation. Um, if he's suspended for something else or something else happens, then yeah, there's standard probably void language for that. But as it relates to the current Deshaun Watson situation, his money is protected no matter what happens from this you know, issue. Damn, <laughs> which, is, which is great. No, which is yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's what I gotta say. Uh, yeah, that's that seems sketchy. If you're <laughs> only the, the Cleveland Browns, only the Cleveland Browns. Only the Cleveland it, it's Browns so tough could. because you you thought they were just starting to work themselves out of being like the Browns, you know, and then they maybe go pull off the worst move they've done yet. <laughs> Potentially. We'll see. We'll see. At least go 0-16, but be morally sound as opposed to <laughs> ch chasing wins, but being morally bankrupt, right? <laughs> right. Um, are there my, any my heart is broken. Are there any, I guess, like looking at positional value, I think that that's kind of an interesting concept. Obviously, running back, those like big con contracts have, have kind of gone down versus all the other contracts going up. Are there any like positions that maybe you think are, are undervalued or underpaid that you're going to start to see like as the league maybe embraces analytics a little bit more? Uh, they're going to you're going to start seeing some record deals like Minka as a safety um, or or whatnot, or maybe as a running back, maybe that I don't know if there is a next running back position, but like uh, any positional inefficiencies in the market that that you guys see. Yeah, so safety was one we talked about forever, and I think now the league is kind of catching up a little bit. We always thought it was a super valuable position. Um, you know, it is. Uh, I think what pushed against that market was. You can find like a good safety. There's obviously there's elite safety. There's Minka Fitzpatrick's that are in a class of their own, but it's very easy to find like a good 80% of Minka Fitzpatrick where you could probably argue it's harder to find 80% of a TJ Watt. But nevertheless, the one for me is still tight end. I think tight ends are dramatically underpaid. Um, you know, it is a short shelf life position. It's physically grueling, and I think that works against it. But the fact that George Kittle signed for $15 million per year two years ago now, no one has surpassed that. We have 12 wide receivers making over $20 million per year now, and he's still top of the market at 15. Um, I, I wonder if, you know, Gesicki and Dalton Schultz and whatever you think about them, I'm not arguing they're better than George Kittle, but they probably should sign deals for more than George Kittle. But I think just like Rob Gronkowski, we opened the show with, I think it's just hard to break that ceiling, but someone has to do it. I think that's valid. I mean, you look at the the – teams who've won the Super Bowl these last couple of years. I mean, a lot of elite tight ends are are on those teams. I guess not so much the Rams, but yeah, no. I mean, what they offer blocking I mean, and, Cooper and Cooper Cup is kind of Cooper <laughs> Cup is kind of a tight end. He's, <laughs> He's kind, of, kind a tight of a end. tight end. Um, um but which is why got, I said like I think Travis Kelsey like is still probably like a really good asset to have if you're the Kansas City Chiefs. I think he was like maybe the most valuable player outside of obviously Patrick Mahomes. Like on that team last year, a hundred percent. I mean, he's making less than fifteen million. He's probably the thirtieth highest paid wide receiver, and he's putting up like fourteen hundred <laughs> yards. No, it's crazy. It really is yeah, crazy. I mean, he's not much of a blocker, um, you know, compared to tight ends, of course. But no, yeah, it's that would be my answer for sure. Do you think wide receiver like has hit? A, we talked about quarterback boiling point, and like you don't think elite quarterbacks that 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 wall will be hit. Uh, what do you expect from maybe wide rec the wide receiver position these next couple of years? Obviously, we saw those trades this year. And um, do you think those will continue to get beat in the years to come and it'll just keep going up and up and up? Or do you think like 
with maybe the DeAndre Hopkins deal, like that was a big kind of jump from the highest paid guys at that time and the Christian Kirk deal. Uh, do you think that it'll kind of like go maybe even down or, or stay level? Or do you think that that is going to get reset every year going forward? That one, I think, is is a bubble that might we, we might see burst in a, in a couple of years. I think smart teams might now you know zag as everyone zigs towards you know even smart organizations like the Eagles trading a ton of capital and, and giving AJ Brown a you know a four year hundred million dollar deal. Um, I, I just think there's so much talent in every draft class, right? And it's like right. if you can find these guys every year that can come in and produce, maybe not as rookies, but by at least by their sophomore season. Um, yeah, I, I do think that we're approaching kind of the, the top of that bubble, which again it, it'll. It'll go down and then it'll go back up again. But I think we're, we're definitely reaching kind of an inflection point in the near future. PFF, I think, would would rank wide receiver as one of the more valuable positions on the field. Uh, would the data change or has there been any change within PFF itself on the value? Because, it again, like you just said, it seems like every single year it's like a historic wide receiver draft class or every single year there's like multiple good ones in free agency. Uh, would you, like, is that a sentiment within PFF that the value of the wide receiver is maybe even getting overblown, even though like, I know that, that you guys push wide receiver value, like put prioritize it pretty, pretty highly. No. So this is kind of like where I come in and, and kind of have these conversations. It's like if you just look at on field value and what they bring to the football field, I think we probably have the number two behind quarterback in terms of their ceiling, in terms of generating wins above replacement. I mentioned this with safeties and I think it's the same with receiver where I come in is like you look at market conditions and you look at scarcity. And that's the thing where like edge defenders, finding an edge defender, you're not going to find them outside the first round. The really good ones are never going to reach free agency. Receiver, like you said, we've now seen really good receivers in the second and third round of every draft class. In free agency, you can probably sign a decent player. You know, guys that make it to free agency that are good players. Like, that's what then affects the market um, is that, yeah, like it's it's not so much what they're doing on the field. It's more, can you get, this is how I always frame it, but can you get 80% of X player's production for 50% of the cost? And I think at receiver, the answer to that question is, is becoming yes. I agree. I totally agree. Do you have a favorite contract in the NFL? Like that's that's the best contract. No one, I guess maybe Kelsey, which is what we talked about. But <laughs> like anybody else who like stands out as like the biggest steal under contract right now that that people may not think about. It's actually a funny question because I submitted an article coming out tomorrow, uh, literally an hour ago, to the editors. Yeah, that my my, my thirty two favorite contracts in the NFL from oh, a hell yeah. Yeah, from a team perspective, um, yeah, I, I would say right now, um, and it's funny because when it first dropped, I was like, what is this deal? But um, a, a good example, if we're going to get into like what teams that do a good job. So anyways, the Philadelphia Eagles, they see Jordan Mailata play for 700 snaps in 2020. That's his entire NFL experience. They give him a four-year, $64 million deal for $16 million per year. Big time money. Um and a year later, it's probably one of the better value deals in the entire NFL because you have the guy under contract for four more seasons. He graded out remarkably for us. And also, if you just watch the film, I mean, the guy yeah, is a road he's, grader. He's, he's, he's real he's, good. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's like it technically, too, like his footwork, he's a dancing bear out there in the run game. You can tell he knows what he's doing. Um, but yeah, so like right now it's number one on the list, you know, which, which comes out tomorrow, but that's just an example of like, you get that early extension done because of what you've seen in practice and, and shout out their offensive line coach, Jeff Statlin, who's phenomenal, but like that deal is such a good value already. That's funny that you specify like from a team perspective, that's how we should start calling like, instead of saying it a bad contract or calling something, we should just start saying it's a, it's a great contract for the player. Is there a, be, <laughs> is there a best contract from a player perspective that you have in mind? Yes. Yeah, so, you, um, yeah. So I say team friendly and player friendly. Cause yeah, I don't want to say good and bad. <laughs> um, yeah. So the most player friendly contract in my opinion is probably Harrison Smith, uh, with the Minnesota oh. Vikings. Actually funny. It's the exact same value. So it's four years, 64 million again, but he signed it at 32 years old at safety and became the second highest paid safety in the NFL, um, behind Jamal Adams. It's just an insane. Co I mean, like he's obviously an elite player. Um, you know, has been for a long time, but just a bonkers contract. Yeah, that one, that one, <laughs> respectfully. <laughs> respectfully. Look, as a Packers fan, you know, hats off to Harrison Smith, one of the dominant players from this era. But yeah, 32 years old. What did you think of the Rodgers deal? Like at this age, like, did you think that that would that make either list or is that just like fine? So his, his old one was on the list last year. I mean, it's it's obviously a great deal for him. Um, it's deserved, though. I mean, he probably could have pushed for more, frankly. Like, I, we talk about quarterbacks, and, and that goes whether it's 
both on-field value and market value. Frankly, those guys could ask for $100 million a year, and, like, they could justify it. They wouldn't win many games, but, like, if you wanted <laughs> to go purely on a spreadsheet and ignore kind of, like, the locker room and everything like that, like, they could push for it. So, no, I have no issue with it. I mean, you're a back-to-back MVP. Um, you're, you've Other quarterbacks have played into their 40s, so I want to say he's 38. I guess you would know. Um like yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a fine deal. It's it, it's a fair deal for both parties, which I know sounds crazy, but it is. That's fair good. <laughs> I, I don't I don't mean to go keep going back to the Eagles, but I'm really glad you brought up Jordan Mailata because that I I keep uh, I do this like daily top 100 thing a hundred like a hundred days leading up to the NFL season. I'm doing each player, and I can't tell. I'm not going to say where he is yet, but I have him like I have him really high, and I was yeah, I was just like he was. He's I've, better I've than Lane seen, Johnson, in I've my re- opinion. Oh, I, I absolutely no. I, I which had, is, I mean, I if, I, I don't even praise. know if I can count like offensive linemen, <laughs> but I know I had like Trent Williams really high, Zach Martin, um, and then I think like Joel Batonio, um, Creed Humphrey, and I think my lot of might have been like the next guy after that as far as offensive linemen go. Yeah, like, and he's like twenty five <laughs> years old. Probably <laughs> should get better. Like it's yeah, yeah. he he's a good player. He's scary. Six foot eight, 270. Well, anybody have anything else? I, I'm kind of out of questions here. Same here. Cooked. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Brad, thank you for coming on. Really means a lot. Um, Hopefully we were able to shed some light on NFL contracts today because sometimes, you know, we, we talk about these things, but I'm like, you know, we're, we're 21 years old. No one, no one cares what we have to say. So <laughs> once again, huge thanks to Brad for coming on the show. Make sure you check out his article on his, uh, most team friendly, most team friendly contracts coming out and make sure you follow him at PFF underscore Brad on Twitter, uh, for some more of his insight there as well. Uh, but Theo, do you have a, a message for us today? I do have the ad read today, and I'm talking about <laughs> Prize Picks. Uh, <laughs> Prize Picks offers more NBA props than any other DFS operator. Uh, not just NBA, but also baseball and playoff hockey, if you're into that kind of thing, um, because the NBA is over. And they offer every player and stack go- category you can think of. You pick two to five players and an over and under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. It's just you versus the projected numbers. You can beat some computer, right? You know more ball than some I, I lame, some computer. lame algorithm out in you know some tech hub, wherever Prize Picks is set up. You can beat those. So sign up and win. Prize Picks <laughs> allows mixed sport entry, so you can take the over on uh, Jimmy Butler combined with the under on. I think I've already used Aaron Judge in the same entry, or maybe I should say the over on uh, on Nathan McKinnon and the under on Aaron Judge in the same entry. So users that deposit and use our promo code will receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. So if you use our promo code, put in $75, you get uh, (laughs) uh, $150. (laughs) Because that's that's 75 times two. Um, Yes. And just be sure to use the promo code. Stay hot. One word, all caps, no numbers. Again, that's the promo code. <laughs> There's stay, no hot. Reason, stay hot. So don't <laughs> hesitate. Don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com and use the promo code stay hot or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. You know what else? Yes. You know what's not easy though? Being a Nets fan right now. <laughs> We got to talk about this Jeremy Grant trade, man. Well, yeah, this is a rare, rare occasion. I am so mad at myself right now. I have never, I almost made a video about overvalued trade prospects, and it would have been Christian Wood and Jeremy Grant, and both of them have been traded now for way less than people expected, and this is not surprising at all. Well, w- well, <laughs> this is a rare occasion where we're actually on the podcast when news breaks instead of like just finishing the podcast, the news breaks, <laughs> and then the episode comes out tomorrow and we're and like, everyone's like, we would, if it wasn't, about- <laughs> we would say something like Jeremy Grant, lifelong piston or something, or <laughs> we'd like lifelong. specifically talk about something and then it ages poorly. But right. I mean, it just broke 
we just got the notification like right before I read that ad. So yeah. Matt, why do you think that he is an overvalued trade prospect and that this wasn't quite the fleece that many people on the instant reaction on Twitter seems to think that it is? Because Jeremy Grant's trade, like, like Jeremy Grant had been one of the most talked about trade prospects for a while. But the reason for that is not because he's so otherworldly, otherworldly amazing. It's because he fits basically every single team. He's a very good role player who plays a very nice role that every team needs. It's not because he's insanely valuable. Jeremy Grant, at the end of the day, is a role player. He is not a, he averages 20 a game, but he does it on not great efficiency on a not great team. Going to a serious competing team, he's going to look more like he did on the Nuggets. And he was a very good player on the Nuggets. But at the end of the day, this idea that like the Pistons were going to get the seventh overall pick for a role player making 20 million a year on an expiring deal, there's just not that many contenders that are going to be able to offer that, right? So when you think about like, this Pistons deal and you look for how little he went for, you got to realize that the Pistons are just looking to sell. They're not looking for something specific back. They're just looking to sell. We know that probably damn near 20 front offices were in on this and that was the best offer they got. Don't look at it as, oh, well, they're idiots and they did like, why would they do this? These other teams must have offered more. They must not have offered more. Right. Yeah, I mean, you look at what he's done the last two years in Detroit, 22.3 points per game, 19.2 points per game. Obviously, as a big man, like, I mean, a 20 points per game scorer is a pretty valuable piece to any team. But you look at his efficiency, yeah, during that time, the drop-off in offensive rating over the last two years and the drop-off, the continual drop-off from his rookie year to now of defensive rating uh, getting worse and worse every season. Yeah, he's definitely not like... Uh, a 20 points per game type of guy on a on a contending team but i don't know i reckon like even if he you get what he was in denver or okc like like you said he every team could use a guy like him you know every team he's going to be a valuable a valuable piece to the trailblazers and i think like a, a very welcome like capable big man um for them this season i guess like the bucks first round pick is going to end up being uh, probably a, a G League guy, right? I, I I guess I would count myself in the group who's a little bit surprised it's it's as low as it was, but obviously it's the best. P- teams don't accept the not best offer, right. <laughs> especially a team like Detroit, who's probably not too concerned about trading him to like a, a rival contender because they are in fact not a contender. The other thing is that Detroit did not just trade him for that first overall pick. They traded him for that first overall pick and nothing else. And he's making $20 million. So they traded him for that first overall pick and $20 million in cap space. And True. that is a lot more. People never think about like, remember when Portland made all those trades at the deadline? Yes. And it was really, and all, all the assets they were getting back, it didn't seem like it was equal. Well, it wasn't if you didn't look at the cap space that they were opening up. I actually... So uh, Port, uh, Detroit now has like $60 million in cap space. They're going to be able to go and, and, and sign guys. So this is them positioning themselves well to go out and use this year where they happen to have like, you know, a year where you don't have much on the books and rarely does it happen for NBA teams. I mean, this is a pretty insane amount of cap space to have. So I, I really like this move for Detroit. They can offer Miles Bridges the max. They can offer Miles <laughs> Bridges the max. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid they might. I actually... Now that I think about it, I don't know what Portland's cap space situation is exactly. I know they have a lot of partially guaranteed contracts, but I don't know if they've actually cut those before they become fully guaranteed. But if Portland's move with the cap space that they opened up is Jeremy Grant, they did a bad job. That's not good. That's not enough. Jeremy Grant, nice player. That ain't cutting it, I'm afraid. It says, leave it, just a quick Google says that their cap for the 2022-2023 season gives them about $63.6 million, which is so they, a lot. Okay. Okay. So they so, might still have about 40 or so So if they still got $40 million, then, then I don't mind it. But it still is like paying a first round pick to sign Jeremy Grant for $20 million is not some insane steal. Now, they still have other moves to go make. If they go get like an Aiton and they're, they're, they're running... Aiden at the five, Grant at the four, that is what would change their defense, right? Or if they can even can go get like a Mitchell Robinson, like if they can go get somebody who can really defend the five, okay, we're talking a whole different game. But 
you're right. It's it's not as bad for Portland if this isn't the big move they're making. I didn't know how much cap space. They yeah, had. no, that was definitely a good I thing to go check up on right there. With your game. We haven't also talked about the Christian Wood deal at all for the That's same we've had thing, some guests dude. On, it really but is. it's we basically <laughs> just talked about the Christian Wood deal. Right. So with with that, I mean, like, I don't hate it for the Mavs, but like. It is not the solution defensively for them. He's cool and they didn't give up much, but it's not, I don't think it's life changing. They, their offense is going to be, kind, they're going to run an offense of five guys who can really go out on the uh, court and score. If they get Brunson, Bra- uh, Brunson back, then they'll be able to, they'll be able to do that. And that'll be interesting, but their defensive personnel, I think it's still pretty weak. I guess you could argue that maybe Wood has been a better defensive player than he was last year. And, He'll probably be more bought in with the math. So I actually do expect him to look really, really good next year. But I think overall, the way that team's positioned is that their defensive personnel is pretty, pretty weak. Now they can make other moves in free agency, but it's going to be tough because that team's getting expensive. The draft is tomorrow. This podcast will drop by the time that it, or it will drop before the draft happens. But if you're um, listening to the podcast, the draft is today. The draft is today, right? (laughs) So. I guess this is kind of the first domino to fall, but we're expecting some others. Malkin Brogdon is one that Ruoj says that he expects to be moved here uh, for maybe the the 10th overall pick even for the Wizards was a, a team that I saw connected to Malcolm Brogdon. So are there any trades that you think like are you should you expect to see or you're you're just like waiting to see or, or how do you feel about that trade or or maybe others? I mean, one of the most aggressive teams in a trade right now, you're going to hate me for saying this, reportedly, is the Charlotte Hornets. For Miles Turner, please don't say Miles. T- <laughs> it's not I never unthink- w- <laughs> Look, man, Miles Turner, they, they... How many years? How many years? This poor... You know what? Here's the thing about Miles Turner. He's basically a, put. He's basically a hornet already with the amount. We talked about him more as a hornet. Than I wasn't. A I wasn't even going to bring up Turner specifically, <laughs> but I'll say this about Miles Turner. I get it's a oh. business, but at a point, let him live, dude. You either got to trade him or don't, dude. This guy has not felt secure that he was going to be living in the same home next week for maybe three years <laughs> in a row. God bless him, dude. Um, but no, I, I think the Hornets are are kind of like we they gotta make a center move and 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 there's been big reports that they're trying to open up cap space to keep Miles, although they don't really need to if MJ will just pony up the money. Um or that they're gonna go try to get a center because they don't really want to draft these two first round draft picks because they already have so many young guys that they didn't get time last year. So if you get I mean, you're gonna have half the team basically be fresh players who have never played, and that's you know, you want to develop the young guys, but we're not the thunder, you know. <laughs> Right. Uh, I, I will think... Say, or go ahead, Matt. I think the Kings have been shopping the fourth pick. And I just... I have not seen a single deal that would not... That would work for that yet. I don't know if you guys have, but like, dude, it's... They want a veteran, but like no veteran is... It, the problem is, is that they have to match the money of any veteran they bring in. So if they go trade for like Tobias Harris, they're not giving up the fourth overall for Tobias Harris. They're giving up the fourth overall and like... Harrison Barnes and it's like at that point are you I mean it, you're hardly upgrading and even then uh, Bar- uh, Tobias Harris is not worth the fourth overall so like stuff like they're like John Collins is like he's good but when you have to match the money you have to also give up your good players who you're paying right yeah I think that the one that intrigues me the most is the um Hawks getting the fourth overall pick and I I, I love the idea of pairing Trey Young and, and Ivy like obviously someone who is like that explosive, like Trey Young combined with Ivy, maybe playing shooting guard. I I really like what that could present for defenses or I don't like it if I was a defense going after him. But um, right. that's one that I, I think like they've got. I mean, we've said it a million times about the Hawks is they've got like role players on role players on role players. So I think that they could make something work. I don't think John Collins for the fourth overall pick is like the most like or a pr- package centered around that is like the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, how many guards does the do the Sacramento need do the Sacramento Kings need to pick in the draft too? So <laughs> I think it'll come down to like who's available in that, in that spot for sure. 
maybe we don't see a trade until draft night. The one that I want to talk like Brogdon to the Wizards is what I is the one that I've seen. And the Wizards hold the seven the tenth overall pick. And it's like Washington Wizards, hear what I say. If you trade the tenth overall pick for Malcolm Brogdon when you are the Washington Wizards, please go somewhere else. Like I don't want to hear about you as a franchise anymore. They already can't draft, so maybe like that's part of the problem. Well, and that's but that's the th- if that's your mindset is like, well, we just we we, we, we will we will be- draft a bad player, so <laughs> we might as well. <laughs> We've gotten burned so many times. Cooked. We got it's like get fire yourself, like remove yourself from the situation. If that's honestly their mindset, it's like, well, we'd never get anything in the draft. These, these worthless picks. <laughs> probably it's like <laughs> probably draft a G League anyway. Take a, so we're gonna take a draft bust anyway. <laughs> like remove yourself, like bro. Malcolm Brogdon is a nice point guard, a playmaker. Every team could use some playmaking, but it's like, bro, he is not getting you anywhere that you want to be it's it's horrible it would be a horrible move to trade for often injured yeah. more expensive when you could have a top 10 nba pick and i get that this draft is not like like stacked one through 10 and like the late lottery is just like oh my god this is what a year to have a late lottery pick but still man like do not do that washington i swear to god do not do that because that is not making that is not I'm making a, you a finals contender advocate. washington do it <laughs> Why? Well, what 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 would their expectation be if they if like Beal and Brogdon and Porzingis like oh um, that's like the worst big three I ever heard of oh my yeah. god that, Brogdon <laughs> he he doesn't play he doesn't play simple as that dog no no serious neither does Porzingis can, it's gonna be yeah, like these, you're these get guys like, and Beal was hurt last year they're playing five games together amazing <laughs> yeah uh, Brogdon's a cool player if he was healthy but he also cost twenty million bucks so it's like what contending team is gonna match that again and that's the problem with the, those big those big contracts but. Yeah, I would agree. I think the Wizards and this, this I, I think Brogdon actually is kind of a tough trade to pull off because really he is probably barely worth a first if that. So, I mean, he's if if he was healthy, we it'd be a whole different conversation, but he's not and he never has been and he's old and he's on a big contract. Um I wouldn't be stunned if the Wizards did something like that though because um you know. They're the Washington Wizards. Look, Wizards, they they're not a but, great franchise sadly. If they were uh, we'd be talking about how they made that one deep playoff run, but they never did do that. <laughs> no, no. Um, although I do love me some Gilbert Arenas. Okay, uh, he was awesome. Like I said on the NBA Live, I want a a Showtime like documentary or or a <laughs> Showtime Lakers style documentary on uh, Gilbert Arenas and Swaggy P and Javale McGee all in the same locker room. That's what the Wizards should be building. Just a fucked up like organization that's at least fun. Brogdon and Beal and Porzingis doesn't even I doesn't even sound fun. No. I'm not feeling awesome about Miles Bridges being a Hornet anymore, man. This is not good. <laughs> all they have to do is match him. That's all they have to do. They don't have to like, okay, Detroit's gonna offer him the max. It's all good. <laughs> it happens to the best of them. They're going to lose bridges. They're going to lose their coach. And your fifth, they could win 50 games take is going to age poorly I when said, they take I, this. You want it to happen so bad. dude. They're going to take top. They're going to pick in the top five next year. Sadly, I see it, it shaping up before me that this dysfunctional organization is, to this. is picking high lottery. They're going to win the lottery which, and which you're going to be age, talking age yourself into this. Which take, which take age is worse. My Saints 0 and 16 take or Matt's. Hornets 50 my, Hornets my take that if 50. they have a good offseason they could win 50 games well if they have a shitty offseason they won't <laughs> yeah well any team I think you could say that for any team I think no, you, you could, could say oh you, you, what's the what's Detroit's path to being that good <laughs> the Wizards uh, the Wiz well maybe not the Wizards I don't see the Wizards winning 50 games next you couldn't year, no say matter that about what like half the teams in the NBA hey, I think the Sacramento Kings land DeAndre Ayton and like they're winning. For, yeah, if they do LeBron. completely unrealistic things, <laughs> oh, if they trade for LeBron, well, then yeah. Well, fifty games is like a one seed in the in the East. It's, it's probably not going to pan out. They won forty three <laughs> games last year. Okay. I'm talking about a so team with seven a more record. games. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. not. Maybe not. I don't you're, know. You're trying to make me out like I'm a crazy guy. <laughs> Everyone can see this. Matt, Matt, Matt's a loon. He's a mad Yeah, man. well, He's the crazy. Hornets, dude, if they mess up, any Atkinson, I will give them a pass on. If they mess up the Bridges stuff, I'm done. This team is done. If they mess, they just got to bring them back. Come be a, come be a, uh, 
or the Pistons, or Aiton, you know, maybe both. Maybe they'll get Aiton and Bridges. I right? mean, and it's not, it's really not ransack unthinkable. both of our teams. Um, I would say this about the Suns. They're getting Kevin Durant, okay? That's what today taught me the most is, you know, if the Kyrie tensions rise and they have to trade him away, I, uh, what was who reported that teams want that to happen so they can put together a trade package for Kevin Durant. Look, I know that I said that the trade for Kyrie is probably like much more difficult than people are thinking just because like who is trading for Kyrie at this point and it's in the Nets best interest to like probably rebuild some bridges here. But upon thinking about it, he needs to go because the Suns are a contender who could put together a pretty fire trade package for Kevin Durant. So in my head, <laughs> in my head, Kevin Durant is might as well be a, a son right now. He's bridges and, and eight and I don't care about the rules. We're tr- packaging both of them for KD. That Thoughts? team would stink. No, it would not. <laughs> K- Booker, KD, CP three, Cam Johnson. Who, who Sarich. playing defense, man? Who cares? <laughs> right. The, I mean, who, you need to be able to play defense. You Booker, can't just out. Okay, Booker is a fine defender. Chris KD Paul is, is getting f- hunted. KD is like a, a f- <laughs> every every point guard gets hunted. Curry was getting hunted. He's a good defender. Luke is getting you, hunted. You're, you're t- Luke, if if you want to tell me that losing your like best two like most impactful two defenders is going to be Kevin Durant. It's Kevin Durant. I, and I'm not saying that it wouldn't make like yeah sure I understand the trade but you wouldn't be you wouldn't you would stink on defense you'd stink. Uh, who cares about that? You know, Me. no one has ever, no one has ever lost a game because they because they couldn't didn't allow. No one ever lost win, a game because they they gave up too many points. <laughs> every every NBA game in history has been won by the team who scores more points. So to me, I want the guy who scores points. You could also look at it as every loss in NBA history is by the team with fewer points. Yeah, but I don't look at losers, all right? I look at the winners and what they all have in common, not the losers, all right? I'm trying to model my myself after the winners, and I look at like the winning teams, and I see Steph Curry. I see KD with his two completely legitimate rings, and his, his <laughs> third on the completely legitimate ring if he joins the Suns. So I just want to say that from all the news today, that one to me seems the most realistic and also the most um, possible. And also... What are the rules say? We can't even trade Aiden for him. You can't do a sign and trade like you plus can't, others. You can't add a player to a sign and trade if you're sending somebody away. If you send somebody away at a sign and trade, it has to just be that player. Okay. Well, okay. That makes sense. Well, then we'll sign and trade Aiden. We'll get, I don't know, some defenders. And then we'll trade Bridges away plus you're picks. Getting, you're getting Gordon Hayward <laughs> in that Aiden sign and trade, big guy. <laughs> no, I'm not. We're getting, um, I don't yeah, know. No, you're big four of Chris Paul. Devin Booker, Gordon Hayward, and KD hey. with JaVale McGee running the five. Is hey, not that sounds winning. like, no, we're winning the finals with that. Look, who is guarding, you know, it's, that would who's be Who's guarding, I'll give you this, who's guarding Gordon Hayward? Who's guarding Gordon Hayward? Because no, they would. The real, the real trade destination for Kevin Durant is he's going to want to prove that he can, he can win a finals by himself. Except he's going to lose finals MVP. I don't think he cares about If he no, cared no, no, about no. that, he wouldn't have joined the Warriors. Who, yeah, who cares at this point? But he's he's going to lose finals MVP to his teammate, future teammate, De'Aaron Fox. I really, I really <laughs> Where did the go. Kings come from? <laughs> this is very serious basketball analysis happening right now. <laughs> I Well, I actually think that the Celtics or the Heat would probably be my one and two. Yeah. If the Heat can do that without giving up Bam, which granted, I think would be really tough to pull off. Uh, you could really see that team going all the way. And KD would kind of be that missing piece. Although I don't know if Hero in a pick package is getting maybe it is. Depends on how depends on how hard KD presses it for like, I'm only going here. Too bad. You have to trade me here. Maybe he could leverage that because he would have a lot of leverage. Um and then the Celtics, the hard part about that one is like are you really going to go to the team? You really, beat you really, dude. Really but like, really, he that? might. He may. <laughs> he may. Knowing, <laughs> knowing, knowing Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant. Coincidentally, he add. is the guy to do that. So <laughs> if they did that, and they, Jalen Brown in a pick package would be, I think, the best offer they could get. And I think that team would be the favorites. 
Matt, yeah. I mean, you've got a lot of Twitter followers and some clout in the NBA. Katie would probably respond to you on Twitter if you just ask him, Katie, where's your head at <laughs> about this? Dude, <laughs> like, needs to take one for the team. right now. I'm, my, one of my biggest fears is that I tweet something about KD and he's just like, you don't know ball and then ratios <laughs> the hell out of me, even if I do know ball. So <laughs> that's, that's Katie's like, you know, in the back, like if I, I tweet something about the Aaron Fox, I'm safe. I'm fine. Nothing's going to happen, right? I tweet something about even oh, like no, 90% might, of players. They're not going to do anything. Kevin Durant, you tweet something dumb about him. He might get you. He's, that's me with Tyron Matthew. When I said that his effort wasn't all the way there, I'm like, he's pretty active on Twitter. He like, there's a good chance he blocked me. He saw it. He, he blocked me. Yeah, he didn't. He oh. did, Tyron Matthew, I'm blocked by Tyron Matthew. But to be fair to me, that's a 100 legitimate criticism of Tyron Matthew. Like, I don't even think he would like. Would he truly deny it? I don't even know if he would because like he went so would long without getting signed. Face? Yes, I literally have film of him like mailing it in. Like I know for a <laughs> fact, like if I showed it to him, he would like have like you can watch my my review on him. There are times where he would like like ease like be running right into a tackle and like ease up and just like let him go right by it. Like there is no way that's acceptable film if you'd bring it up. But anyway, I digress back to basketball, probably a more realistic scenario. Um I would say, I think the Jazz are an interesting one, like go bear over these next couple days, weeks. Uh, the Bulls rumors are really heating up, um, which we talked about a little bit on this show. And we've also talked about Donovan Mitchell trades. Uh, but I think if they trade go bear, they are not trading Mitchell. I, I they're not going to trade both of them. They don't have, don't they don't have the nuts both. to do that, I'm afraid. They just are not. They're too scared to actually blow it up, even though they should. And no one would see the end of it. I think like that's like you'd get they're already the coaching staff is probably already on somewhat thin ice. Like I feel like if they were going full reset mode, the owners would just be like new coach, new G like right. all of that. Like would they really survive like three like a thunder, like two, three losing seasons and then try to build it back up with the same thing that just failed. So I don't know. They definitely want to have a winning record in, in 2021, but the Gobert and Mitchell situation might be so bad that they have to part with one. Uh, but yeah, Gobert to the Bulls. We've had multiple conversations about this, but I think that that would raise the the Bulls. I mean, I'm not the world's biggest Rudy Gobert fan, but like I will acknowledge like he's better than Vucevic. Yes, I, 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 I talked about this in a video a uh, yeah. little while ago their perimeter defenders are just so strong it's just such a shame to waste it on a bad interior defender it's just a, yeah. and it doesn't have to be Gobert and I, I guess the big thing is like now if you feel like Levine's gonna be back maybe you trust Lonzo to get healthy and you can be aggressive and if they can and they get Gobert that defense will be a nuts and they'll I think they'll beat expectations I really do it's tough I think though, that would be I think that that could be a final to make it out of the east I really do I think like that team with some decent defense because this year they were kind of frauds because they didn't, they could just could not get it done against a winning team at all. Um, I think next year the the team will have a little bit more. And they get Pat Williams back too, although I guess he'd be gone in the Gobert trade. If they keep, and yes, like you can't win a title with DeMar DeRozan being your best player, but like, I kind of think Levine could one day be that. Like, I think Levine and DeRozan is, as good as like, or maybe not as good, but it's not that far off from like Chris Paul, Devin Booker. It's not that far off from like Jimmy Butler, uh, Bam at a buy. Like, it, like those two caliber players surrounded by Gobert and and some some nice role players, Lonzo. Like, we'd have to see what they give up for Gobert hypothetically. But like, I would not be low on that Bulls team at all, being a one seed or or being something like that. I, I, I really think that they. I don't know if it's a finals winning team. I don't know if they have a guy with a superpower or a guy who is just like crazy good to give you that ceiling. But I, I think they could make some serious noise in the regular season at least and it'd be a really high seed if they were to do that. Right. No, I agree. Um, I agree. I, I think that them positioning themselves to like win the finals is probably just not doable with their current roster, but they can be very competitive with a very good roster. So I wouldn't be mad to see them do that. And there's all the Kyrie stuff too. Yeah. 
I think there's still probably higher odds than people give credit to this, like not blowing up, but man, it's not looking good right now. Is it? <laughs> yeah. I, I think like the nets in general, like it's, it's gotta be tempting to just exit the Kyrie Irving show and just wipe your hands clean of it and just not deal with him sitting out or being a martyr or whatever he wants to do anymore. Um, gotta be tempting, but at the same time, you're kind of, you're kind of selling your title hopes and you kind of got to have to restart from nothing. And are, that are you winning a title anyway? I think you could. I still think you could with Simmons and Katie and Kyrie. I think in an ideal world where all of them, yeah, like, in an ideal world, but does that no, world like, exist? Like what I think ultimate it does universe exist. are we envisioning where <laughs> <laughs> Ben Simmons, Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant all play all like. All the, it would like, be tough like, to even more it, than like 50 games together. <laughs> You're right <laughs> that it is. It's not it's not looking great considering the personalities of all of those guys. But I mean, the East, I mean, it's it's there for the taking. If you've got those three guys, they don't even need to be, you know, they don't even need to be a one seed for it to happen. They just need to be like if you could rest them and you, you just need to get there and have them all be healthy then like it's not the craziest thing in the whole entire world yes. i think and I just, I if think they like could not just not playing together like it's I, it's a chemistry thing it would be tough it would be tough man but i mean <laughs> you just made all these deals to be a super team like and it like, didn't work just give it, it didn't work but Suck maybe it, it still could well, i don't you see know the Woj <laughs> report right that he like the idea would be that Kyrie would take the mle to go there would take would, what would, he would take the mid level exception. He wouldn't he wouldn't need like the sign and trade. He would just sign there straight up for like next to nothing. That's what Woj tweeted. Which I think would be completely insane. That is but that's, the thing is, bro, is like they just would not stay healthy. They won't. Hell no. The odds of that are just so ridiculously low. Maybe I'm being too. Maybe I need to, to reel back a little bit on that, but like, dude, their odds would be so bad and you need Anthony Davis to stay healthy. And I think the defense, actually, if you got the right role players, could be okay. But the health thing, well, you'd be at a huge disadvantage. I would do it, though, obviously. Don't get me wrong. Like, yeah, you know, go get Kyrie. Go trade what you got to trade. But uh, the Lakers right. are in a tough spot regardless. I, I think it would be cool. I'd be, it would be sick. But this is the advantage of being in L.A. People want to go to L.A. People do want to go to L.A. Right. It's also the advantage of having uh, LeMickey. <laughs> Le, le GM is going to start le sending GM. out. I don't even know if they have the pieces to trade for Kyrie. Like people are like, oh, he could go to the Lakers. It's like for what? Like Kyrie's a pretty good player. Like, are you trading Westbrook for him? Probably not. <laughs> you trade THT. Like who else is even? have value to get a superstar like i i have no idea no a sign and trade probably it's just not gonna work yeah but so man man i'm really worried about bridges dude i'm gonna be crushed you are tweeting like what we're talking about i'm like getting my as notifications on my phone like, like as we're talking well i'll be like i'll be like maybe the maybe the, they'll just go get Aiden, and then i'll see the tweet met from mad like maybe the owners <laughs> are just doing it maybe they're just doing this for Aiden. Like, well man, you are it would be very hard for them to sign both Aiden and miles bridges to maxes it, it they don't be. have that type of money i don't think well maybe in a sign trip maybe they can't they won't nope Miles, Miles said, I'm too good of buddies with LaMelo Ball, and I want to play with him. And then he made a big grin. Did so. he say that? <laughs> he did say that he, he would be, he, he did say recently he'd be willing to take a pay cut to stay with the Hornets. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I really. You seem, you seem like that's really it reassured you. It, dude, I'm just, it's not even that the team would suck. I'm going to have to hear it on Twitter. I'm already hearing it. He's a piston, Matthew. Just accept it. We've been I'm hearing it since we got... If you got, tweet at me something about Miles leaving and he stays, I'm retweeting it. I'm keeping receipts. I'm has, bookmarking it's, your Twitter. It's funny because no one across the NBA landscape gives a shit about the Hornets or Miles Bridges except for Seven. you. I think you're the Miles number Bridges one. is nice, dude. Yes, but no one care. If someone like retweeted, like if you retweeted, hi, I told you Miles Bridges think, would say they would be I like, I told you he wasn't leaving the Hornets. You <laughs> idiot. Like, you moron. <laughs> they would be get like, him, guys, I, get him. I do not care. This is, <laughs> we do not, we do not care. We do not care. I want you to make a TikTok and just be like, 
<laughs> all the haters were all definitely the haters. Haters. yeah the hornets haters are mad right now <laughs> ranking the most controversial figures in in the nba number number two lebron number three kd number four Kyrie. number one miles bridges all my <laughs> why does everyone across the nba landscape have so much to say about him I'm trying to think what what NBA franchises we never talk about. I mean, the draft is I'm tomorrow. Trying to, I'm Jabari, trying to think about what kind of coffee we never talk about. Oh, <laughs> we drink here. We drink Trade Coffee. This podcast is brought to you by the best coffee supplier on the market, Trade Coffee. Uh, they personally sent me like some samples to try, and it is legitimately very good. I'm obsessed with my most recent order, and I know all of you will love it just as much. Right now, Trade Coffee is offering a quiz to specifically select the perfect blend for you. Uh, and it's none of this BuzzFeed, you know, pick a taco topping and we'll give you your, you know, coffee. No, this is this is more scientific. It knows than that. you. I took the quiz like, and Trade not recommended. Like the NBA um, quiz. Uh, I took the quiz and. <laughs> Trade recommended the Red Rooster Star Hill Stout Blend, and it is legitimately some of the best cold brew coffee I have ever had. There's there's just something about making it yourself also, exactly the way that you like it and kind of tinkering with it. And with Trade Coffee's quality ingredients, I, I know that I'm always getting the most solid cup of joe money can buy. Uh, there, uh, plus even if you're not obsessed with your first bag, Trade will take your feedback and an actual real life coffee expert will work with you to find a new, better suited bag for no extra cost. And no, it is not just me in a mustache pretending. Um, it's me it's in a mustache a, pretending. It's Spaden in a mustache <laughs> pretending. <laughs> no, it's a real, it's a real, it's a real one. Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off their first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash stay hot. That's more than 40 cups of coffee overall for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash stay hot and let trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash stay hot for $30 off. All right. Well, before we get into our rank it segment, I just want to remind everyone to go join our chalkboard chat. We've had this new community that we've built on chalkboard thanks to our good friends over at chalkboard, of course. If you want to submit a question for the week, for us to read on the podcast or suggest what we rank every week or you just want to talk to us like we're we're active like during games and stuff or like we have a chat just for my album so if you want to talk about talk to me about my album <laughs> like you can do that too chalkboard is the place to do that right it is basically the stay hot hub of sports at this point and it's going to be a hub of sports for you know i think a lot of people here to come soon it's a great line of com communication from us to our listeners so we can really help grow this community and build the podcast together plus chalkboard has a ton of cool features like live box scores so you know you can talk to us you know, during games and talk about the game with us while following along in the app. And I think by far the coolest feature is the live bet tracking. So, you know, no matter who, you know, if you use FanDuel like I do, that's something that you can connect to Chalkboard and track your bets live and show people in Chalkboard and be like, hey, here's what I'm betting, you know, and if you want to follow their bets or follow my bets or follow Theo's bets, you can do that directly from the Chalkboard app. So it's really, it's a really cool way to integrate that. We love Chalkboard. We know you guys will too. So make sure you download the app and join the Stay Hot group or just check out the links in our social bios or in the video description below. I think right now it's only on the Apple App Store, but they are coming to uh, Google Play soon. We've talked to the, we like, we have a direct line of communication with the developers. So if you do have any questions or anything that you even want added to the app, like just tell us and we can probably get it done. But rank it. All right. Uh, you guys know the rules of rank it. You give us something to rank and we rank it. And Juicy J in the chalkboard chat asks us to rank movie villains. Um, but I think I think TV villains were also like allowed as well. So if you have like a TV show. What about real life villains? <laughs> <laughs> Who's number one? Real life The Detroit villain. Pistons front office. <laughs> Deshaun <laughs> They Watson. haven't even done anything yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'm not gonna, dude. Villains, I'm not gonna be Deshaun Watson. <laughs> like, okay, I don't want to talk. I don't want to. I can't drag down the rest of the podcast with my negativity and Hornets talk. <laughs> would 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 the front office of the 
even if this did happen the way that you're fearing, would that even be, would that, would they be the villains okay, in this it would story? Be, it would be Michael Jordan for being the cheapest owner for absolutely no reason. It would be him. It would be his fault. <laughs> okay. Tough. Yes. Okay. Right. I top, think I have got five, top five, movie top five. Films. Okay. Or okay. TV, like movie TV, like whatever. <laughs> no books in my head. You asked me to name five, five villains. Okay. I might not be top able to do it. Top five fictional villains. We'll say top okay. five fictional. I'm number five, I have the the pixies from Fairly Odd Parents. You know, the ones in the suits? <laughs> okay. You know what I'm talking yes. about? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't you. have expected those. Yeah, neither right. Bladen knows exactly. Bladen's, thank God, Bladen is like, you named a kid's <laughs> show. I actually know those. <laughs> Yeah. And number four is is Jerry from Tom and Jerry. <laughs> Wait, you can you think Jerry's the villain? Oh, absolutely. Jerry sucks in Tom and Jerry. Fuck that mouse. Tom, Jerry's team the Tom for life. No, he's not. Don't care. Tom is literally just chilling. All right, and Jerry comes out of nowhere. This show really works in like a protagonist antagonist. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a cat. It's just a cat and mouse. <laughs> <laughs> one of the great, one of the world's <laughs> genius TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of the greatest TV shows. I love it. <laughs> What's your favorite episode? <laughs> Actually, no, I do like the one where, um, <laughs> where he hits him with the big hammer. Him, yeah. dude, that's sick. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's the, um, it's the one where like Jerry freezes the entire house and they have like this big <laughs> ice this big like ice skating. No, oh, it, dude, it's season seven, episode thirty. Bro, that yeah, was so crazy when Jerry froze hey, hey, the house to get Tom. <laughs> no, they were just I, like you know, fuck y'all, man. <laughs> Matt, Can we do what's 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 next on your list, dude? I I I am not gonna lie. I don't know. I'm just going to go off the top of my head. You oh, only like rom-coms. You like rom-coms. So it's this like is, you don't even this, have... I don't only like rom-coms. Who's the villain in... Um, who's the, the villain in When Harry Met Sally? <laughs> I don't know if there really is a villain in When Harry Met I don't Harry really think there Sally. is either. Um, maybe maybe Harry himself, some would say. Some would say. Some would, some say. would say, I think. Say. I think I think my number... For, can we do... I'm doing video game ones too. Okay. I'm doing Fair the enough. dude from Far Cry 3. I'm you know, lost I'm on video games. You so. guys have never played Far Cry I, I 3. I never played Far Cry. All right. Okay. I'm I'm not going to explain that one then, but I, th- I think the listeners will know what I'm talking about. Number yeah. three. Dude, I don't know. Doing these in order <laughs> off the top of my head <laughs> means three? that you guys have... <laughs> How about I go first then? All yeah. right. Yeah. Give me a little bit you of time to think first, about it. Oh, right. I have a, I'm not going to... I'm not going to rank them. I've just got some... The f- okay. mm-hmm. first one, number one, my favorite is Benjamin Linus from Lost. Uh, my favorite TV show of all time. Just his, especially like this is spoiling Lost, but that show debuted in like 2004. So if you haven't seen it by now, like, sorry. But like when he first comes in and, and claims to be the guy from Minnesota and like they're deciding on on if he's good or bad and like that whole build up to him actually being the villain is like some of the best episodes of TV and one of the best plot lines ever. Cause he, he really does convince you that he's the good guy. And then that whole reveal and the others and all of it, like, I know he's not the one who says it, but like Walt's son, like we're going to need to take the boy, like lost listeners know what I'm talking about. Uh, another is Snape who I think this will like, cause some doubt like oh he's a, not a villain he was a good guy in the end it's like i don't care for 99.99 percent of harry potter severus snape is a villain character and it rocks and he plays a great antagonist for 99.99 percent of harry potter i don't want any self-proclaimed hufflepuffs yelling at me like actually did it all for what this. house are you yes i would say gryffindor <laughs> but well, do i don't know, know. You guys um, haven't taken the, the, the I, I quiz. I have taken the test. I can't. I um. Uh, I'm Ravenclaw. Ravenclaw. That's what I guess. Yeah. I'm Hufflepuff. <laughs> How's that funny, man? Shut the fuck up. Gryffindor <laughs> is like literally like. What is it? Name one thing about Gryffindor. They're cool, and the main characters and the leads. They're just yeah. They're, they're just dudes, just things man. They're just guys. No, they're not. They're, they're just literally the, they literally like save the whole world like multiple times in the maybe book in the trilogy. books, but in real life, it's just a bunch of heroes. That's the worst you know? one. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> I, but you know, or maybe I'm Slytherin. Bengals fans would would say they're just anti-Slytherin. Like Slytherin bad. 
Gryffindor, good. Hufflepuff, clumsy weirdos. And then Ravenclaw, smart people. Uh, clumsy That's weirdos. what they're billed as. That's Gryffindor, what they're billed as. Gryffindor, stupid jerks. Uh, Hufflepuff, <laughs> really cool, well-rounded guys. <laughs> Outside the box. Anyway, I think Snape is is on that list for me. I don't even remember the name of this villain, but I, I very much enjoy Sean Connery's performance in The Hunt for the Red October. He's got some Russian name. I'm sorry, I've, I don't remember it. Um, I would also say those are three. Um, I'm a big fan of... I'm a big fan of like Mr. Robot, the show. It's like just the villains from my favorite shows, Mr. Robot, Tyra Wellick, and the CEO of that show, whose name I also forget, the <laughs> CEO of E Corp. Uh, that also rocks. And I need one more uh, best movie villain of all time. I would say um, I'm not totally sure. Those are definitely. I got a TV four. one that I know I'm throwing in there. Okay, what are you putting in there? Gus Fring for Breaking oh, yeah. Bad. That's he's pretty cool. One. He's pretty he's cool. sick. I, yeah, I know that's like maybe that'll be my basic one. Yeah, that'll be my number. I, I have seven. Oh, Joffrey, Joffrey Baratheon. Have... He's number from Game of Thrones. That's number five for me. That okay. guy. I've never okay. wanted to strangle a TV character as much as Joffrey Baratheon in Game of Thrones, and like just pure evil. I hate you so so much. Um, Game of Thrones in its prime was it was just so well written, and he was he was just evil. I mean, he was a villain, villain. So I'll go with him. I'll go with Joffrey, right. Snape, uh, Benjamin Linus, the the dudes from Mister Robot, and uh, I don't even remember who else I said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I I have seven potential guys. So the first one, I'm not, I'm not going to explain all of them. So, uh, but the first one is. Uh, or I guess number seven would be Zaheer from The Legend of Korra. I like villains Ooh. that have like... You, have that? you seen The Legend the of Korra? Show? No. Okay, that's why you don't know. No. Okay, I like villains that kind of like have like some sort of like moral... Like they're, they're right, but they went too far. I like villains like that. And Zaheer is a guy that like he hates the... like. He hates like author authority figures, except he just tries to just murder every authority figure in the world. And one of those is the Avatar. Oh, so he's like Mao. Just yes. kidding. <laughs> Actually, yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> or it's like Pol Pot. Uh, and then anyway. the next, I have, I have an, I have one other cartoon villain, and it's the Lich it from Tom? Adventure Time. <laughs> <laughs> the what? That the Lich from Adventure Time. That is the mo that is the most like terrifying. Like like as a kid watching that, I I was like, oh my, this shit is like hor horrific. I haven't um, seen it, so I can't say. All right. I've only seen a couple episodes of Adventure Time, but I would I would honestly put the Ice King up there. I'm a big Ice King fan, but he's if, like if you get into like late seasons, and the Ice King isn't really a villain. He just. He's just trying to like get with Prince of Bubblegum the whole time. Enough, man. All, he just wants to love. He just wants right, to Right, I don't love. know if I'd consider him like a true villain, but I don't know he how many episodes. I've only seen and, like a dozen episodes and of that, And then if you get really life, far so. in, you realize that like the Ice King, like the whole reason that the Ice King ended up becoming a villain is because he like got corrupted by this magic um, helmet that like he, like his helmet, like his ma is magic. <laughs> and like he used it to save someone so like that's the only reason why he's the way he is but okay, it's like okay. totally like he's it's weird but the lich is horrifying oh my god how many episodes um, does it appear in not many hmm. it's like super ominous but okay it's like it's like a le it's like an urban legend until like you see it and you're like oh my god um then i so then we get into like movie villains and i have vader Mm -hmm. okay. um, and and especially recently because I started I've been watching the Kenobi show and they they portray him so well. It's like comic book Vader. He is damning. It's amazing. I love it. Um then we have the Joker. Um You which, know, you're gonna get you're gonna get a lot of flack for picking the Joker in these times when people are all jokered out at the moment. Really? Are they? Are I they think so. I think so. I've seen some some like Bro, the Joker, oh, of course. The the jo Joker I think the Joker's like, a good pick though. I agree. He's a, Joker's kind of sick, villain. dude. Um yeah, no, I, I like I I'm not like a big I'm not like the biggest Batman fan in the world, but like 
Joker's love- sick, man. Joker's he's dope. sick. He just, he's just, he's a true cold hearted villain, like at his core. He just hates everything. And that the next guy in my list is kind of the same way Palpatine. Um, you sit in the main ones. <laughs> I don't blame you for that one, though. I, 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 Palpatine, Pal- I, Palpatine shows I up Pal- in like, I guess he's in the prequels. I think Palpatine's, uh, I think Palpatine's a more, like, once you get like, like, I've watched everything Star Wars. So, like, when it comes to, like, Palpatine and watching how he's, like, pulled the strings for, like, decades, and then it it's so incredible. Like, everything is, like, gone to his design, and it's Have ridiculous. you read the comics? I've never read, like, the Star Wars. I've I don't read, know I've re- I, 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 I'll, I'll read, like, Star, I'll read, like, Darth Vader comics online just to see how, like, <laughs> how powerful, like, he just, he's so imposing. And and I just love to see stuff like that. It's a shame I that Disney Vader, will never though. Disney will never like give those guys like a show that would actually let them be like villainy. I think yeah. like they're villainy already, but like I want a villain who like chops people in half and like you know <laughs> is like swear like, can watch, swear watch, can swear. Watch, <laughs> I want a villain watch, who can <laughs> swear and say watch bad words. Ki- watch, Watch the Kenobi <laughs> show on Disney Plus. I think they make Vader look really menacing. I, heard I think that, they that, do a really. I heard good that job. that show is some mid. It has it has its. Mid what moments. has not been mid that Star Wars has released since since I guess you love Revenge of the Sith. Revenge of the Sith is great. I thought the Mandalorian was pretty good. I think Kenobi's good. I Kenobi love, has the same plot as the Mandalorian. It's like pr- it kind of does protects the kid on Tatooine. It's, it's like, just okay. kind of boring because <laughs> it does. It can't really develop your their characters that much because it's already determined how they're going yes. to be exactly. Right. But I don't know. I, it's it's more like we wanted we wanted like a story of like what happened to Obi Wan after he went to Tatooine, and then there's like. Uh, but the, yeah, I mean, uh, the Clone Wars show. I, I digress. Think, the Clone Wars show is amazing, <laughs> and I thought Rebels, the show Rebels, is really good. Um, so I had Palpatine. I don't know how we got so off track of Palpatine, but Palpatine's a phenomenal villain. Uh, number two, Thanos. Um, another guy. Right reasons uh, went too far. Like you want to, you want a magic gauntlet to like, you could have just doubled the resources instead. You wanted to kill half. I would have done way cooler <laughs> stuff with the gauntlet. Personally. <laughs> yeah. What you would could you do, have done with the gauntlet, man? I don't know, man. You could do like literally whatever. I'd have to, yeah. have, you could have, yeah, I would have like you, a big you, ship. <laughs> I could just make it real quick. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I'd, he make, the, I'd make, I'd make miles. I'd, I'd give miles bridges. <laughs> I'd make another miles, miles bridges. <laughs> I would turn back the clock. The and starting I would just five keep the Hornets would have right now would be nuts <laughs> if I had the Infinity Gauntlet. I would, f- I would have fixed Baker's shoulder. Um, <laughs> um, and then number he one, st- he would still be mid. <laughs> anyway, and then number one, number one, um, I think people are going to be surprised that it's not Thanos. Uh, Agent Smith from the Matrix. I think that is the absolute coolest vi- because he's like a parallel. Of of Neo, the protagonist, I think that and like them being like one in the same is so underratedly cool. And like even to the point where like there's like the theory of like, oh, well, uh, Agent Smith's actually the one, not Neo and all that stuff that goes into I, I, I love I always go back and watch that final that final fight between Neo and Smith. In, uh, I think it's Rem- mm-hmm. I, I, I he was pretty Rebels. baller. I, I actually one. agree with that one too. I, I like I love that Agent one. Smith. I think he's. I think that's cool. <laughs> I haven't watched all the Matrix, but I, I do think it's a pretty cool villain. Like, like I, wh- every time I watch favorite- Will okay. Will Anderson, like I would scout someone <laughs> and Will Anderson, I'd just be like Mister Mister Anderson. Mr. Anderson. I that, that would run through my <laughs> head every time. Say, Will like, like every villain, I feel like has to have some sort of catchphrase. The coolest catchphrase or like call signal. The coolest one of all time is. Mr. Anderson, Mr. Like, Anderson. It, it is. is catchphrase. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, dear, I can't do it. No, the, 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 the thing that makes you a good villain is you have to like say cool stuff. Yeah, you just exactly. got to say some. You like, got to say cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, you got to say like the Thanos, Joker. He I'm says inevitable. dope stuff, man. <laughs> Vader, Than- I mean, Thanos basically only said cool <laughs> stuff, and it worked, man. <laughs> it worked. You just gotta exactly. Have some hard Vader lines. only says. Palpatine only says cool stuff. Uh, yeah, it works. It works. So, Agent do Smith, I need two more of all time? 
No, I think we're good. <laughs> okay. I, I can give you, you I can give you like, the you, like real quick. Of the podcast I'll say Thanos and then I'll say the zombies from 28 days later. And I know the zombies one's kind of cheating, but eh, I mean you that's you scary, listed the man. agent fairies from <laughs> <laughs> the, fairly odd they're the pixies right <laughs> the pixies. that's yeah, what they are right yeah i'm going with you're them, right. dude. <laughs> i'm gonna have an right. awesome list with pixies and zombies the pixies i thought the, you meant the band like when i first i was like what? <laughs> <laughs> i've played uh here comes your man i, I can yeah. play that song. where's where's my mind uh anyway <laughs> we gotta wrap this up yes Th- thank you all for tuning in this is the longest episode of stay out of all time but Tons of content coming away on all platforms. We'll be back with another episode next week. And as always, from Corn Boy, Bird Boy, and Lemon Boy, we will catch you all on the flippity flop. What's up, everyone? I hope you all enjoyed this episode. I know you trust us with your sports content. So Blue Wire now has a new podcast called Don't Trip, where they give sex, relationship, and dating advice. So make sure you hit the link in the description and subscribe for Don't Trip's hilarious and insightful content.